Before I get started with my message this morning, I want to share with you something that happened uh, at the office here this week, which I'm still having trouble getting my head around. We had a visitor late this week. Um, I guess technically it was late this week because I took Thursday and Friday to spend with my wife, but uh, so I guess technically it was Wednesday, but we had a visitor here at the church, and he never left his name, but he had a pretty interesting story to tell, and some of you may remember the name James Gwaltney. A few of you? Apparently James was a member here for many years, and then eventually, I guess, went down to New Life and um, spent time there, but apparently he was an avid tither and participated in putting his tithes together and uh, offering them to the church as a way to support the ministry work of the church. And he passed several years ago. And the person that came in didn't leave his name, but he said, I'm the grandson of James Gwaltney. And apparently he died three years ago, and I found his Bible recently as I was going through some boxes. I found his Bible in the box of his stuff. And contained within his Bible was a Four Mile Creek Baptist offering envelope. And contained within the envelope, I'm trying so hard not to tear this. was his tithe. And it just didn't seem right that even though it was in cash, to use this for my family. So I'm bringing it to you. Isn't that lovely? So to Mr. Gwaltney's grandson, may God rain blessings down on you, sir. And may we never forget that as a church, we do so much and we see so many things that we never know the outcome of. When you give a sermon, one of the hardest parts is wondering whether the sermon you gave impacted people. And sometimes you know it did because you see it and people tell you, and sometimes you just wonder why'd you bother. And I don't put that on them, I put that on me. But it's nice when the Lord gives us the ability to know that we made a difference. Because I never met Mr. Gwaltney, but apparently he raised some pretty cool grandkids. So just blessings upon that family today. Today is Mother's Day. And it's good to see a bunch of folks here with their moms. It's good to see a bunch of moms in the sanctuary, and many of us have moms who can no longer join us in the sanctuary, and I want us to remember all of those people today. We even have some folks that are in close proximity to us that are about to be moms again, and are currently pregnant. I want to turn your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 19. Didn't know this is where I was going to start today. It's not where we're going to stay, but it is where we are going to start. John chapter 19, specifically, starting in verse 25. Now to set this up, this is the time of Jesus' crucifixion, his arrest, his torture, his humiliation, has now reached the point to where death is imminent. And he is literally participating in what has been described as, by historians as the worst form of punishment ever devised by man, a crucifixion. And he's had, as one theologian described it, a pretty bad 24 hours. And yet, in that moment, he is still thinking 
of the people in his life. And in verse 25 of John's Gospel, chapter 19, it says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. So literally, facing death on a cross after a horrible 24 hours, Jesus is still worried about his mother. I know many of you have cared for either your own mother in her final years or perhaps the mother of your spouse in her final years. But what an amazing thing to realize that at the time of his death, the one he was worried about the most was his mother. But I've often thought in each year that we do Mother's Day sermons, I think about it, and it's a question that just never leaves my head at this time of year, is what must it have been like to be the mother of the baby Jesus? Let us not forget how Mary found out all this was going to happen. And that is the visit by the angel Gabriel, who basically informed her she was going to be with child. And then she carries the child who is hunted by the authorities. They have to leave the country. And then eventually they're able to return. And then they go about the task of trying to raise Emmanuel, the Son of God. Now, how many of you here had some children that were just perfect? One mom is buttering up her children by raising her hand in the sanctuary this morning because her children are sitting right next to her. Most of us don't have perfect children. But Scripture tells us Jesus never sinned, which means he never backtalked. He never asserted his authority against his mom. He never said, no, this is my toy and I'm taking it. He was literally the perfect child. Now, how many of you had some children that weren't perfect? Interesting, the same woman just raised her hand. That's fantastic. <laughs> but we all know what it's like being a kid, because we all were one. Most of us were not very conscious of that time. We're like, hey, I'm going to be a kid now, or I'm going to behave this way now, or I'm going to intentionally act out against my parents. It just comes as a consequence of growing up. But what must it have been like to be the mother of a perfect child? Did she fret and wonder, when's he going to start acting out? Is this the year? I know many a mother of teenagers who went, my child was such a perfect child, and then he hit 13, and I don't know what happened. And that never happened for Miss Mary. What was it like to be the mother of a perfect child? What's the old expression, walking on eggshells? I mean, did she ever spank God? Think about it. But was Mary a perfect mother? You know, the answer to that question is a resounding no. And the proof is in the Gospel of Luke. Turn there, if you would. Luke chapter 2. And here's proof that Mary is not a perfect mother. Specifically, verse 41 in chapter 2. And the story here is really meant to be focused on the development of Jesus as a young man. But I'm going to take a little different twist on it. 
And I think this is proof Mary was not a perfect mother. Verse 41, Luke chapter 2. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And when they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother, Mary, did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went on a day's journey and sought him amongst their relatives and acquaintances. So here's the proof that Mary is not a perfect mother. She literally lost track of her 12-year-old child in a city with a million people. Like, where is he? I don't know, but I know he's okay. No, he's with our relatives, so he knew when it was time to leave, and he got on board the caravan. We know exactly where he is, right, honey? Can't you just see that conversation? You mean you don't know where he is? Well, no, I thought you knew where he was. Well, I thought you knew where he was. So where is he? Stop the caravan. Now, the only story I have like this in my memory comes from when I was, I don't know, I was four or five years old. And my father and was still as part of our life at, at that age. He left a couple years later, but he was still there at the age of five. And he had this ridiculous Volvo P1800 two-seater sports car with an imitation back seat. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, the, the width of that back seat, Ted, was nine inches. That's not a back seat, okay? That's a shelf. And worse, Volvo didn't make it like a flat seat. They curved it to the underbody of the car, so literally the seat went like this. And my mom and dad decided that they were going to take all five of the children in this Volvo P1800, because my dad loved that car. And any chance he had to drive it, it didn't matter, you have to pile a woman and five kids into it. By God, we were getting in the Volvo P1800. And we drove 50 minutes to an hour away to see Dave and Susie Fairbanks, which was like the family friend of old that my dad worked with. And so we piled all the kids and the dog in the car. Because the dog, Shannon, was the daughter of the mama dog at the Fairbanks house. So this was a whole excursion. Five kids and a dog in the back seat. Although if I'm... More than likely, my little sister, the baby, was probably sitting on mama's lap in the front seat. How many know that's true back in the 1960s? Because this is what we're talking about, right? The kid just sat in the front seat. I'll stop her with my arms. It'll all be good. And the way my dad drove, it was a good bet that she was going to have to stop at some point suddenly. So we went up to the Fairbanks for this excursion, and as we were leaving the Fairbanks, all, you know, you have to wrangle all these kids that have been playing with, and they weren't cousins technically, but they were country cousins, you know what I'm talking about. And we pile them all in the car, and we get into the car, and we're driving on the highway, and we get 15 minutes from the house. And somebody says, where's Shannon? That would be the dog. We had left the dog behind. Now what I remember specifically about that trip, because it was such a cool experience, is when this discovery was made, we were right at an exit, and my dad used the sports car ability of the Volvo P1800 to take that exit ramp at 60 miles an hour with a wife and five kids and no dog in the car because he was not happy. But what I remember specifically as a kid is my head smashing against the window of the car when he turned the corner at 60 miles an hour, and I remember hearing in my head, followed by because he rode rubber around that whole corner at 60 miles an hour. This is the closest I have in my life experience to Mary and Joseph in the caravan going, where is Jesus? So I don't know if caravans went, I doubt it. They didn't have rubber wheels. But that's what I picture when I picture this story. And every time I read this story in Scripture, that's what my mind flashes back to. 
is the panic in the mother's eyes that we left the dog behind. How much more so would it be for a mother to lose her child at 12 years old and leave him in the city? My wife tells me a story once when she was in the mall. And I think Paul was so small, it was probably less than a year. And John was roughly two, two and a half years old. And they went to the Benton Harbor Mall. And Paul was in the stroller. And John was free as a two and a half, three year old. And he thought it'd be really cool to run away from mom in the middle of the mall. And as Kay tells the story, I just sat there not knowing what to do because I can't run after him with a baby in the stroller. And she was mortified because what you do when your two and a half year old leaves your sight in the middle of a public mall. This is, I think, the fear that Mary had at this moment in Scripture. In verse 45, and when they did not find him amongst the relatives, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. How many know Mary has such a wide range of emotions right now? She's got the panic and the adrenaline from, I can't find my son in a city of a million people. And now I have found my son and now I'm going to kill him. How many know exactly what I'm talking about? You're not actually going to do that, but boy, the anger combined with the grief, combined with the release, combined with just this innate desire to, I don't know, hug slash choke your child at this moment is just amazing. And Jesus said to them, why were you looking for me? Remember, he's 12. Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? They did not understand the saying that he spoke. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. Every mother's dream regarding her teenager. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. Remember, she was told you are going to have the Son of God. Scripture says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. You know, sometimes when you put a sermon together and you're imagining what it's going to be like in your head, it's not anything like at all what it comes out to be when you get in the pulpit. Because I actually haven't even started my sermon yet. So as opposed to leaving you here, till 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock on Mother's Day and generating the wrath of moms and sons and daughters. We're going to save the rest of this for next year. So good news is I have Mother's Day sermon next year all written. So let me finish with this. The other thing I always want to acknowledge on Mother's Day is not only do moms love their children... They love them despite the way the children sometimes act towards them. They love them when the children do things that moms don't understand. And man, how often is that? They love them when the children are born less than perfect or seem to be perfect and then suddenly aren't when they hit 13. My mom had five natural children one of them turned out all right. We're still trying to figure out which of the five that is, by the way, in case you think that was an ego-driven statement. Because every one of us was weird in our own way. And my mom was far from perfect, just like yours. 
The problem is, for many of us, our moms were far from perfect. And that creates special problems every time there's a Mother's Day. Because how do I love a mom that abused me? How do I love a mom that left to pursue her own interests? How do I love a mom that was more worried about my brother or sister than me and I kind of got forgotten? How do I love a mom that was far from perfect? And the answer is, you don't do it in your own strength. Just like you love your child even when they misbehave, you love your mom even when they misbehave. And they will because they're far from perfect. My relationship with my mom was weird. So weird I'm still trying to figure it out and she's been gone since 2012. And I'm still trying to figure it out nine years later. So I wrestle with this. But here's what I know to be true. I know that my mom, even though she wasn't perfect as a mom, I know she loved me and did her best to express it in the only way she knew how as for who she was at that moment in time, which was also far from perfect. But I know that I was also far from perfect. Because I lied to my mom. I made fun of my mom with my friends. I called her bad names only once to her face. I learned that lesson. Don't do that again. The funny thing is, is that somehow we believe that other people are supposed to be better than us. And then we are disappointed when they're not. Isn't that funny? We do the same thing with our pastors, with our spouses. When are we going to start holding ourselves to the same level of account that we hold the rest of the world? Because we're far from perfect too. You don't love your mom because she was perfect. You don't love your mom because she gave you everything you ever asked for because that would not be a good mom. You don't love your mom because she was your best friend. You love your mom because she was your mom. In the hours and the moments of sacrifice that you will never know and that she probably would not want you to know I think about the fear that my mom must have had when my dad left and being a single mother of five kids who hadn't worked in 15 years. And not to besperch my father, but he wasn't very good with the money coming back home. And suddenly she had to figure out how to feed five kids ranging in the ages of three to 13 with no job and no work experience for 15 years. And a family that ostracized her because she was getting a divorce and it was against their religious beliefs. Man, how do you do that when you're far from perfect? You do that because you rely on God and you pray a lot. So today, this Mother's Day, I have a challenge for you. Imagine that, Pastor Mike challenging the congregation. That's new. I want you to write a letter to your mom. If she's still alive, maybe she'll even read it. If she's not, it's not important because it's not about her anyway. It's about you. Write a letter to your mom. And thank her 
for all the things that she did that you don't even know about. All the sacrifices that she made that you'll never find out about. Thank her for being far from perfect because I don't know about you, I wouldn't want to be the son of a perfect mother. How do you live up to that? On his cross, the time of his greatest pain, Jesus said two things of great import. One, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he made sure his mother was taken care of. Biblical scholars tell us that Mary moved in with John and stayed with him 11 years until she died. John took care of this woman that wasn't his mother because Jesus said, behold your mother. And he adopted her as mom and she adopted him as son. Write a letter to your mom. You will be blessed for it. Let us pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for making this message your message. Thank you, Father, for our moms, those that are perfect and those that are not. Father, as we pray, I'd like the moms in our sanctuary this morning to stand up. Because you can pray both sitting and standing. Father, these are your servants. These are the ones that you entrusted with children. And although they were far from perfect, Father, they did the best they could with what they had. Despite their shortgivings, we still love them. Despite even their abject failures, we still love them. Despite the times that they're even embarrassed by their behavior, you still love them. And we are commanded to do the same thing. Father, thank you for mothers. Bless these moms today. Bless those that we now remember that have been gone and are now with you. Father, if our moms are here today, let us reach out and connect. Let us bless them. Let us shower them with praise and gratitude for all that they have done. And Father, let us be excited by the new moms in our sanctuary as well. May they be the best moms that they can be. May their children love them as much as you love them. Father, bless us as we depart our sanctuary this morning with the love of Jesus and the nurture of our parents in our heart. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.